OK, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome along to this Energy Futures Lab uh, webinar, the latest in our series on materials for energy. My name is Connor. I'm the communications manager at Energy Futures Lab, and I'm delighted to welcome you along today for this um, presentation by Evangelos Kalitsis. Evangelos is a PhD candidate in the material in the minerals, energy and environmental engineering group based in the Department of Earth Science and Engineering here at Imperial. He trained as a chemical engineer uh, with an MEng from the University of Patras in Greece and specialized in process system at process systems engineering with an MSc from Imperial College London. His research combines environmental and techno-economic modeling to study the production, use and recycling of lithium ion batteries from a life cycle perspective. And he's going to speak to us about some of that uh, research today. Before I uh, hand over to Evangelos for today's um, presentation, uh, just a reminder that uh, the presentation will last around 30 minutes and then there will be some time for questions and answers. So if you would like to submit a question, use the Q&A box, which you'll find on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, you can put your name with those, but remember this uh, webinar is being recorded. So if you would like to, um, if you if you don't want your name to be read out, you can uh, submit those questions anonymously if you wish. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over now uh, to Evangelos. OK, thank you, Connor, for the introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen. All right. OK, so uh, I'm Evangelos. I'm a final year PhD candidate at Imperial, and I work under the supervision of Professor Anna Kore and uh, Professor Jeff Kelsall. Today, I'm going to present a journey through the automotive lithium ion battery value chain and discuss the lessons that life cycle assessment teaches us on how to make it more sustainable. The presentation uh, will go as follows. Uh, first, I will cover some technological, market, and value chain aspects of electric vehicle batteries. Next, I will present the models that we have developed on a life cycle assessment of battery production, use in electric vehicles and recycling. And finally, present some key takeaways and an outlook. So as Connor said, this will take approximately 30 minutes and please feel free to, to use the Q&A box to, to send your questions and we'll have plenty of time to discuss on them after the presentation is over. Uh, there is currently no doubt that the decarbonization of transport systems will primarily come from the replacement of internal combustion engines with electric vehicles. And in order to shift away from internal combustion, we need lots of lithium ion batteries. And this is what you see uh, in this graph, where demand for batteries is expected to increase ninefold by 2030. And this demand is vastly driven by electric mobility. This is the, the dark blue part of the bars. So we need to ensure that the batteries we put inside our vehicles are produced, used, and recycled in a sustainable manner. Now, uh, the batteries that go inside an electric vehicle are often, uh, they're, they're first of all lithium ion batteries, and they're often categorized based on the type of cathode material they include. So we have nickel cobalt aluminum oxide, which is used by Tesla, then we have lithium manganese oxide and then this NMC formulation, which stands for nickel cobalt manganese oxide. And uh, I mean, this this NMC uh, start with uh, the 111 variation, which uh, means that they include equal parts of nickel, cobalt and manganese. And there is a tendency to increase the nickel content of the cathode because this increases the energy density and also reduces the use of cobalt in the batteries, which is expensive and generally has a troubled supply chain. 
The NMC family of chemistries uh, is expected to dominate the automotive market. As you see uh, in the graph, different shades of blue correspond to different variations of NMC. And this graph is for Europe, but uh, similar trends are observed around the world. On the, the anode side, uh, things are less complicated. Uh, graphite has been and will be the dominant material in battery anodes, and in the future we might see some silicon inside them. Uh, let's now have a look at the different steps, including the value chain of a lithium-ion battery used in electric cars. First, uh, raw, material, raw materials are produced, including nickel, cobalt, copper, aluminium, etc. Then, the cell components, such as the anode and the cathode, are manufactured and are put together to form the battery cells. Uh, which together with supporting structures such as the battery management system, system, the thermal management system, and some packaging are assembled to battery modules and packs. The battery pack is consequently integrated to an electric vehicle for an extensive use period and is ultimately uh, repurposed for a second life or recycled. So the general goal of my research is uh, to study this value chain for electric vehicle batteries, and we generally split it into production, use, and recycling. Um, I focus on uh, NMC chemistries due to their domination in the automotive sector. Also interested in exploring geographical variations across the value chain and also to account for technological developments in lithium-ion batteries, such as increasing their energy density or increasing the lifetime. Now, uh, in order to do that, I use a tool called Life Cycle Assessment, which provides, provides a standardized procedure to estimate the environmental impact of goods and services. This procedure is described in ISO documents and includes the Golden Scope definition where the product system and boundaries are clarified. Uh, the inventory analysis, including the quantification of the flows associated with the system, and this is usually done based on engineering calculations or modeling tools. Then we have the impact assessment stage, where emissions are categorized into environmental impact indicators and the interpretation phase where the results are evaluated. Now let's move on to the first part of this presentation, which has to do with uh, battery production and see what life cycle assessment teaches us about it. Uh, this study was published approximately a year ago and was the, the first one from my PhD. So, uh, the motivation behind doing an LCA of battery production was that when I started uh, my PhD, I noticed this paradox in the literature, which is shown in, in this graph. So, what you see here is the carbon footprint or the global warming potential. Uh, and uh, this carbon footprint in China, as shown in the, the red uh, bars, was generally predicted in the literature to, to be lower than the rest of the world. This was a paradox because China has one of the most coal-intensive energy mixes. And we aim to, to create a more realistic life cycle assessment of battery production, primarily focusing on China. Uh, the second motivation behind this work was to quantify the environmental impacts of increasing the, uh, the nickel content in battery cathodes and introducing silicon in the anodes of uh, lithium-ion batteries. So we created a model that uh, took into account all the necessary steps to produce a battery pack 
from raw material extraction to battery pack assembly, and this is a, a simplified representation of it. Also, uh, in terms of mass composition of the battery pack, we modeled uh, a 253 kilo, uh, kilogram battery with 60% uh, of it coming from the battery cells and also a, a good contribution coming from the, the packaging. Now, in order to, to serve the, the goals of this study, we also developed several scenarios and I'm not going to go into much detail. Uh, let me just point out that the background scenario was developed to compare our model with preceding literature. Uh, the baseline scenario included the production of a NMC 111 graphite battery pack in China. And we also had two novel electrode scenarios, one including silicon graphite anodes and the other one utilizing a, a nickel rich NMC 622 chemistry. And you can see in the table how the energy density of those battery packs was increased. The first uh, major finding of this work uh, is shown in this graph which is again the carbon footprint or the global warming potential. And we can see the background scenario that was developed as representative for production in South Korea. And this is the baseline scenario representative for China. And is, its carbon footprint uh, is generally predicted to, to be 40% higher. Um, next, we have the results for introducing silicon in the anode, but let me briefly explain what these graphs show first. Um, the first two columns include the studied impact categories, and in the next two columns, uh, the aggregated results are reported on a battery pack and on a kilowatt hour basis, and they are broken down to their key contributions in the bar chart. Now, I would like to focus your attention on the first line of this graph, which uh, shows the global warming potential. And as we can see, it's vastly dominated by the electricity supplied for cell manufacturing. Concerning uh, batteries utilizing silicon graphite anodes, we observed that the ozone depletion potential and terrestrial acidification potential were increased by 16% and 10% respectively. Uh, however, the 54% increase in the battery's storage capacity caused significant reductions of approximately 30% on a kilowatt hour basis. The scenario was similar for uh, nickel rich chemistries, and we observed that doubling the nickel content of the cathode increased the terrestrial acidification potential and particulate matter formation potential, but the increase in the energy density of the battery caused reductions across the remaining impact categories on a kilowatt hour basis. Um, now let's move on to the use phase, and this is some work that we did jointly with the Electrochemical Science and Engineering Research Group here at Imperial, and uh, their expertise in thermal management of batteries was actually very useful. So let me uh, briefly explain what the, the general concept first. Uh, this equation, describes the carbon footprint of an electric vehicle. This is typically measured in uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilometer. Uh, in order to calculate it, we usually multiply the, the carbon footprint of uh, battery, battery production, which is the one I described before, with the capacity of uh, the battery pack add the carbon footprint for producing the remaining parts of the vehicle and divide 
by the total distance driven throughout the vehicle's lifetime. Then we add the carbon footprint for charging the vehicle with electricity and also some maintenance. So what this equation tells us is that uh, anything that increases the kilometer distance driven by the vehicle will reduce the carbon footprint. This distance is controlled by the lifetime of the battery we put inside the vehicle. And one way to ensure longevity of battery systems is that is by ensuring that they operate in an optimal temperature range. The temperature is controlled by the thermal management system. So we were interested in quantifying what is the achievable reduction on the carbon footprint through the implementation of more efficient thermal management. Uh, what I explained for the carbon footprint is true for the life cycle cost as well. And uh, this is something that we also calculated. So we, we kind of reverse engineered the correlation that I showed you before in order to develop our models. Uh, first, we performed some TMS operation modeling to calculate the maximum operating temperature for each thermal management option. Um, then we performed some capacity fade modeling to calculate the achievable battery lifetime in given temperature. Those were integrated to life cycle cost and carbon footprint models to calculate the achievable reductions. Um, the first important finding is uh, that when an air cooled system is used, the battery operates at uh, a maximum temperature of around 40 degrees Celsius, and this results in a lifetime of approximately 1300 uh, full equivalent cycles. For better thermal management systems, such as surface and immersion cooling, temperature was kept below 25 degrees, and this led to, to an increase on the lifetime of approximately 70%. Uh, this increase on the lifetime had a direct effect on the life cycle cost and the carbon footprint, which are shown in, uh, in these graphs, and both were uh, approximately reduced uh, by a quarter by when we, when we employ the better thermal management strategy. Uh, this reduction is quite significant as we are talking about the overall cost or carbon footprint of an electric vehicle, which takes into account the, its energy consumption or the production of the battery pack. And the only difference between these scenarios was changing this small system that controls the temperature of the battery. Uh, that's all for the use in electric vehicles. Um, let's see now what happens to batteries after they reach their end of life or what ideally happens because there is also the case for simply disposing the batteries. Uh, this is something that we, we currently work on with my supervisors and it's mainly focused on modeling an end of life treatment chain for lithium-ion battery, batteries. Uh, the, the motivation behind this work is explained by looking at the system for end-of-life treatment of lithium-ion batteries. And what happens is that after a battery reaches its end of life, it's collected and sorted uh, based on its chemistry or based on its type and after the battery pack gets dismantled. Uh, the battery cells get discharged and they are fed into cell recycling processes, which include either hydrometallurgy or pyrometallurgy. 
and the metals included in the packaging, the thermal management system and the battery management system are recovered through other pathways. So most of the literature has focused on what happens to the battery cells and our interest uh, lies what, on what happens to the battery pack as there are significant fractions of uh, aluminium, copper and steel used in it. And uh, this is what I showed you here is exactly the chain that uh, we are modeling in this work. Um, let's unzoom a bit now to, to see the, the bigger picture. Uh, when recycling is included in the value chain, an additional environmental burden is introduced because it requires energy and materials. Uh, but the recovery of secondary material introduces a benefit to the system, which is modeled through the displacement of primary material. Take, for example, uh, copper, and we see on this pie chart that approximately 25 kilograms of copper are, uh, are recovered and these 25 kilograms are assumed to displace primary copper from the market and this results in environmental benefit or results in a credit to the system. Also, uh, when studying the environmental aspects of battery recycling, uh, it is common practice to exclude the use phase in order to explore the achievable environmental impact reductions on the production footprint of a battery. So these are the results for hydrometallurgical treatment of uh, battery cells and materials recovery from the battery pack. We also uh, have created a pyrometallurgical case, which I'm not going to discuss in this presentation, but it's important to keep in mind that lithium is usually not recovered through pyrometallurgy. Uh, this graph shows the environmental burden of battery recycling, and we generally see that the magnitude of the burdens is significantly lower than those for the production. Also, uh, cell recycling, which is this dark blue uh, bar, mainly contributes to the energy-related impact categories, while uh, the metals uh, recycling process from the battery pack mostly contribute to, to the toxicity and the ecotoxicity uh, impact categories. Now, I would like to to focus your attention on the this number, which is the global warming potential, it's 14, and uh, this number is the human toxicity potential, it's five. And let's see at the benefit. Uh, so global warming potential benefit is minus 60, and the uh, human toxicity potential benefit is minus 17. And if you compare the, those numbers to what we had before, uh, we see that recycling can be very, very beneficial from an environmental perspective. Per, per, perspective, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, if you look at the graph, uh, showing the contributions to the overall environmental benefit, we observe that most of the benefit comes from the recovery of aluminium and copper. Uh, this highlights the importance to establish circularity on a pack level to unlock the environmental potential of battery recycling. Now, uh, let's have a look at the carbon footprint in this graph. Uh, we have battery production, then uh, in dark, dark blue, then but production and pyrometallurgy in orange and production uh, and uh, hydrometallurgy in green. And this is for China, North America and Europe. And uh, we see that it's a, a battery produced in China 
uh, has a 40% higher uh, carbon footprint, as I explained before, uh, when compared to Europe. Uh, but this relative difference uh, drops to 20% when recycling is included. So what this graph tells us is that recycling is a tool to effectively reduce the environmental impact and regions with high footprints can possibly use it in order to compete in environmental terms. Um, that was all for the recycling. Let's now wrap up what we saw in the three parts of this presentation. Uh, first, we saw that producing a battery consumes a lot of energy and this causes a high geographical dependence on the environmental footprint as different locations have very, very different energy mixes. We also saw that increasing the energy density of a battery poses no significant environmental threat and is actually very beneficial because we simply use less amount of materials to produce a kilowatt hour of battery capacity. Battery, uh, battery lifetime uh, was shown to be a key factor determining the life cycle cost and carbon footprint of an electric vehicle. And one way to increase it is through more efficient thermal management, which reduced the, carb the, the carbon footprint and the life cycle cost by a quarter in our case. Finally, battery recycling on pack level was shown to be very beneficial from an environmental perspective due to the displacement of primary materials with the ones recovered. So I, I would finally like to give you a perspective on what has happened and will happen on the carbon footprint of lithium-ion batteries. And that is a metric that has uh, attracted increased attention uh, due to its contribution to the overall footprint of an electric vehicle. So the industry started approximately on 2015 and batteries back at the time were mainly produced in pilot scale or call it mega scale plants as shown in this first bar. The transition to gigascale uh, manufacturing caused a significant decline on the energy use, and this is what we see in this bar. Uh, and the, or the orange part of it is the energy, and we can see that uh, it dropped by more than half. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, what happens? Uh, in the next bars is that the energy density is increased by altering the underlying battery chemistry and also the energy uh, mix gets decarbonized as we go, you know, over the, the, the years. And the data behind uh, the, the, the modeling of the energy, the, the carbon intensity of the electricity mix is based on the the, the sustainable development scenario of the International Energy Agency. Uh, finally, the emergence of battery recycling, uh, which many, many industry experts will tell you that it is expected to occur at scale in 10 years from now, effectively reduces the materials footprint of the battery pack. So this dark blue, uh, part of the bars, and the, as, I, as I explained to you before. Um, overall, this graph shows that the carbon footprint of battery production will probably uh, decrease fivefold within the next decade compared to, to when the industry started. And this is very, very important for an, in, for an industry which is, is predicted to increase ninefold in terms of scaled, scale, as I explained to you in the beginning of the presentation. And uh, with this, I would like to end this presentation. Uh, thank you all for joining today and for your attention. And uh, I'm looking forward to receiving your questions. 
Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Evangelist. And just a reminder to everyone that you can submit uh, your question through the Q&A box, uh, which you'll find on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and I'm going to hand straight back uh, to Evangelist because I can see that uh, we already have a question there. Um, so Evangelist, can you see that? So I actually cannot see the question. Um, uh, on the Q&A, but I can't see the, the So if you if you go to published in the Q&A field, can you see that? Mm. OK, don't worry, I can I can read it, read it for you. Okay. Uh, so it's from uh, Aristides who asks, uh, he says, well done uh, for an excellent presentation. And he has a question regarding the production scenarios. What was the process for coming up with these scenarios and uh, not the basic, the variations? And to what extent uh, have they been informed or validated by industry, uh, for example, uh, battery manufacturers? So the, let me just go back to, to the scenarios. So uh, say here, um, in order to develop uh, this model, we we started with uh, you know doing a literature review and uh, uh, putting all the process together that uh, uh, that uh, are, are are included in in battery pack production. And uh, what we usually do in the life cycle assessment is to to try to get. Uh, uh, data from the industry as much as we can. So in in this uh, production case, uh, for example, the energy used uh, in battery production is uh, is based on industrial data. But of course, there are uh, some assumptions inside. And I mean, many times we, we I mean, there is uh, there is no LCA that doesn't include the assumptions. So we for example, for the, the novel electrode scenarios, we made our, the assumption that, you know, the, the production processes or the energy use is not going to change significantly. So, yes. Great stuff. Another question from um, Maria, who um, says, um, thanks for a very well presented and informative uh, presentation. Uh, firstly, she asks, how common are surface and immersion cooling systems in EVs compared to air cooled systems? And secondly, is the global warming potential for Europe the lowest compared to China and North America because of the electricity mix or are there other factors dominating the ranking? So, sorry, Connor. Can can you please re repeat the the first part of the question? Yes, she wants to know how common are surface and immersion cooling systems um, in EVs compared to air cooled systems. How come? How uh, common? Common. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so actually, I I, I think that uh, I mean, if you looked uh, at the industry five like five years ago. Uh, you would see mostly um, uh, air-cooled uh, systems, but uh, I mean, right now I know for sure that uh, Tesla uses some kind of liquid cooling, uh, which I'm not sure if they use surface or immersion, but I mean, it's a, a similar type of cooling. So I think uh, the industry is, uh, is, is becoming aware of uh, of what I, I, I presented to you and uh, the benefits of better cooling systems and they are trying to to use them in their batteries. And about the, the second part, which uh, was like about China and uh, uh, so if uh, if the if the footman in China is is higher because only of the electricity mix. Uh, so uh, it's mainly because of the the coal intensive electricity mix but it's also because of different footprints of uh, of the of the materials production and just to give you an example uh in in those batteries we have lots of aluminium as i explained like for the for the packaging or for the the current collectors 
And uh, this aluminium in China is produced with using energy from coal, while uh, in Europe or North America, it's produced using energy from hydropower. So this this is also causes a, a big difference on the, on the carbon footprint, like the, the the materials footprints, not only the the battery production footprint. Okay. Uh, a question from Alexandra, who says she really enjoyed the uh, the presentation. Where does the energy use come from uh, during? Um, where does the energy use come from during battery production? She asks. Um, okay. So let me just find slides. So uh, that's an interesting question, and uh, many many people have have tried to to answer it. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so during the assembly of the battery cells, we have two main sources of energy use. Uh, the first one is the is conditioning the dry room. So because uh, electrolyte the electrolyte is sensitive to humidity, um, uh, the the assembly of battery cells is is performed in a dry room, and uh, conditioning this dry room consumes a lot of energy. Uh, then we have uh, NMP recovery. So NMP is a solvent that is used to prepare to to slurry, slurry the mixture. So here what we do is what people do is that they mix the active material with uh, uh, PVDF and some uh, uh, additives and then they, they slurry the mixture and coat it on the current collector foils. And uh, the, uh, this process uses uh, NMP, which is an organic solvent, and NMP needs to be recovered. And the recovery of NMP uh, is very expensive and is also energy intensive. And there are also, uh, I mean, during the preparation of the, the active material, the cathode active material, uh, what is uh, usually done is that uh, people take nickel, cobalt, uh, and manganese, or as all as sulfates, and uh, there is this co-precipitation process, which uh, uses ammonia, and processing the wastewater of this process is also energy expensive, and of course, okay, we have the calcination, which uh, I mean, it's it's a high temperature process. So yeah, overall, I would say that the conditioning the dry room is uh, the most important expense. But the, what I described, like the NMP recovery and the copper precipitation calcination, also use good amounts of energy. Okay, um, there's still some time for questions. So if if anybody has any other questions, uh, do get them in. Um, Question from from me, if if I may. Um, so your work obviously um, deals with with um, batteries for for EVs. Is there particular are there particular characteristics of EV batteries that make them um, unique uh, to to other um, applications of lithium ion batteries? Um, you know, in relation to your work. Yes, so I mean, of course, there, there are unique characteristics. So I mean, the, the main characteristics of, uh, of a battery is it's, it's, it's gravimetric energy density and it's volumetric energy density. So uh, in electric vehicles, we, we, we need both of those quantities to be high because we don't have too much space and we also don't want the battery pack to be very heavy. But in other applications, say, uh, grid storage, so storing electricity from the grid. Uh, people don't care that much about uh, the volumetric energy density because I mean, it's a battery that I mean you, you can put anywhere and uh, I mean people might not mind about about the space. So these batteries generally come with lower volumetric energy densities and uh, that's why we might see also different technologies there that uh, have lower volumetric uh, densities. Great stuff. 
Uh, sorry, uh -huh. and it's uh, it's it's also uh, we might see different variations of lithium ion battery chemistries. Okay. Super. Just just a, a comment there from somebody who said uh, your your father taught him in uh, polymer science and engineering um, in the University of Patras 25 years ago. He says to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, good stuff. Well, if there are no further uh, questions. Uh, we can we can wrap it up there. So thank you very much, uh, Evangelos, for that that uh, great presentation and for uh, for taking all of those uh, questions. Where can people uh, find out more if they're looking for for more information, or how can they uh, get in touch? Okay, thank you so much, Connor, for having me, and thank you all for the Q and A. It was very interesting. Super. I can. Um, um, just somebody else uh, thanking you there for. Um, for your presentation in the in the comments, um, super. So yes, can can people find you um, online? Your I think your um, your PWP is on the Imperial website. Yes, and people can get in touch that way. Great, good stuff. Well, thank you everybody for joining us, and uh, do keep an eye on our on our Twitter and our LinkedIn, and of course on our website for for you for future um, uh, webinars in this series and. Uh, if you're looking for previous uh, webinars, you can find them on our uh, YouTube channel and this one will, will go up on our YouTube channel as well. So please do feel free to uh, share it with anybody who couldn't uh, make it today. So thanks again, Evangelos, and thank you everybody for joining thank us. You very much.